So I'm going to say a few words about um, hyperbolic functions, and then very quickly I'm going to move uh, to something much 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 more exciting. Um, so um, this was. This was three eleven. That's great. Um, so let me remind you, uh, the hyperbolic sine, which we write sine h, is uh, e to the x minus e to the negative x uh, divided by two. Uh, the hyperbolic cosine is e to the x plus e to the negative x divided by two. Hyperbolic tangent is sine over cosine. Um, <clears throat> so what can I tell you about these functions? Well, I can tell you what they look like, first of all. <clears throat> so here's the hyperbolic sine. Um, so, The first thing I notice uh, is that well, it goes to infinity. Um, I notice that it's odd. That means that when I when I rotate the figure um, 180 degrees, it stays the same around the origin. I notice, uh, and that's because hyperbolic sine of negative x is negative the hyperbolic sine of x uh, because this equals e to the negative x so first of all this is e to the x minus e to the negative x divided by two so if i plug in negative x in there this is what i get positive so here i have to two negatives they become positive. Um, and on the other side I have negative e to the x minus e to the negative x divided by two. And and these two are indeed equal. <clears throat> so that's one thing I notice. Also I notice um, that as as x approaches in positive infinity, this is going to become very tiny, very fast. The exponential of a very large negative number is one divided by the exponential of a positive number, which makes it uh, which makes it um, uh, tiny, and this approaches infinity very fast. The only time I'm allowed to say it's exponentially fast. So, so clearly, um, e to the x is the important part, and indeed, as as I look to the right right parts of the graph, it looks exactly like uh, the exponential function. Let me show you that. Um, here's the exponential function. Uh, sorry, divided by two because there's a. Uh, so remember that hyperbolic sign is the exponential. But no. So. Um, after a tiny bit, they, they start to look pretty much identical. <clears throat> and on the left, the same thing happens except with e to the negative x, um, with a negative sign. So somehow, hyperbolic sign is something that happens in between these two. I mean, it's the average of those two. Uh, 
And the thing is, most of the time, one of them is pretty much zero. Uh, and hyperbolic cosine is the sum of these two, which um, makes it an even function. Um, what do I want to say? Um, it approaches, it's, it, it gets very close to sine of x as well, as you can see here. So there's a lot of things you could say. So that was the gateway arch, uh, which um, I, I think I'm, I'm forced to talk about. So why do we care about hyperbolic functions? I don't have a million reasons, um, like Lady Gaga does. Um, I know, I mean, Honestly, I think the main reason is that when someone says to you hyperbolic sine or cosine, you don't think uh, you you realize that you are that you know what they're talking about. I think that's the the main reason. Uh, they do appear in places like the book claims that the the formula of the speed of a wave you get a hyperbolic tangent somewhere. Um, uh, and the other reason is that um, a falling, so um, a piece of string apparently uh, if you let it hang from the edges uh, has the shape of a hyperbolic cosine. So um, you take you take some string or a chain or a cable or a wire or something, and it makes uh, and it makes a shape that I think people thought it was a parabola for a while in history, but it's not a parabola; it's a hyperbolic cosine. Um, this I can see why this would be important if I was you know building a bridge with hanging wires or any sort of uh, you know, electricity lines, telephone lines, um, the the wires on the 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 wires <clears throat> that carry electricity for trains. Wait, do American trains have those wires? I don't, I don't even know. Um, apparently, this also means, and I have no idea whether this is true, but this also means that if you take the shape and put it upside down, this makes a very efficient arc. And I am no physicist, I am no architect. I don't know, I've seen YouTube videos trying to explain this to me and I uh, sort of buy them. I honestly, when architects explain things to me, I start feeling like more buildings should fall down than they do because yeah. But something about this shape being stable when it's upside down means that uh, there's no there's no pulling forces anywhere. So all the forces um, are all the forces are pushing down, or something about the, the force going exactly in the direction of the of the arch and not. Moving on to the sides, I don't know. Anyway, what I know is that um, is that who was the architect of that art? I have no idea. But this guy, um, whoever designed the that arch in St. Louis, looked at looked at this and said, clearly, I'm going to be the most famous architect in history if I make a hyperbolic cosine arc. And he did. And indeed, if I look at this picture. It does look like um, it, do, it does look like this function and not like a parabola. And it hasn't fallen down yet. So <clears throat> uh, 
I don't know. Um, so why do we call them hyperbolic functions? Um, also, I don't want you to memorize anything on hyperbolic functions. Um, they're not that important. Turns out, um, turns out that there's a hyperbola where uh, they they give you points on the they give you points on the hyperbola. So if you have a hyperbola. I guess first of all, remember that this shape is a, is what we call a hyperbola. <clears throat> Turns out the points on the hyperbola, uh, just like the points on the circle, look like cosine of something, sine of something. These look like hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic sine of something, but in the in the circle, these points are um, uh, x is is the arc length, but here x is the area in here for some reason. Anyway, they have something to do with hyperbolas. I have uh, never used this property in my life, um, but um, well, there it is. So. Um, why is this a hyperbola? And, and a thing that's interesting about these functions is that um, we have a bunch of identities that look like trig identities. So um, for example, so this is pretty interesting how it just works out. Um, for example, um, cosine squared plus sine squared is one. Turns out if you take hyperbolic cosine squared and you subtract hyperbolic sine squared, you get one. Um, let's, let's do that. <clears throat> I feel like this is interesting. So hyperbolic cosine is the average of e to the x and e to the negative x. And hyperbolic sine is the average of e to the x and negative e to the negative x. <clears throat> so now I have those squares. So how do we operate with those again? Cool. Once when you told me I've been disconnected for 15 minutes. How do you simplify that? There's a square, there's another square. There's some sums inside of the squares. There's um, minus between the squares. Yeah. Do we go through the derivative? Is that, are we supposed to solve for the derivative now or are we just like? I'm not, I mean, I don't see a reason to to take a derivative. I feel like this is an, an algebra problem. There's no calculus here. It's just um, simplify a, an expression with some exponentials and some squares. Square every term, combine fractions. Uh, I, I feel like you have to elaborate on what I'm supposed to do, both, both of you. Because sure, you could combine fractions, but you could do it right or you could do it wrong. Uh, I guess, is it enough for you to type in the, in the chat, combine fractions, but do it correctly, then you would be correct. Uh, and the same goes for square every term, Sydney. Um, because I think that means uh, you go like this. Um, Maybe I'm wrong about what you mean, but uh, this doesn't work. Um, 
the square of one plus one is not the square of one plus the square of one. Oh boy. Uh, so, um, so you see it. So you have a fraction with a square. Uh, what you what you should be doing with a fraction is squaring the numerator and the denominator, because that's how algebra works. And then I have a and then I have a, a sum, and there's a square, and the the square of the sum is the square of one plus the square of the other plus twice the product. Oh, I guess, and and the square, the square becomes uh, a two in the exponent. So, um, but I don't want to do that either, because um, I can do something better, which is I have two squares and they're subtracted together. And when you have two squares subtracted one from the other, that is the same as the sum uh, times the difference. And that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, I have e to the x plus e to the negative x added together with e to the x times e, um, minus e to the negative x times the difference. So same thing with minus sign. Because if you expand the products on the right, you get the, the stuff on the left, you get a, an extra thing that cancels. If you foil, um, if you, if you, if you do good old nasty foiling, uh, the outer and the inner are gonna cancel each other and you're gonna be left only with the first and last, which the technical term is full uh, for. So, um, but foiling is confusing, I don't like it. So now I have two, two factors there that, um, well, there are fractions added together, but they have the same denominator, so I can just, so this is the same as one half times um, times e to the x uh, plus e to the negative x plus e to the x minus e to the negative x. I can, you know, I can think this is how you add fractions that have the same denominator, or I can think uh, I'm taking a one half as a common factor. And here I have the same thing with a minus sign that I gotta be really careful about because if I don't put the correct brackets, everything's gonna go to shit. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm almost done because um, a lot of things here cancel. Uh, this cancels with that, and here some things are gonna cancel. Let's just write it down again. One half times e to the x plus e to the negative x plus e to the x plus e to the negative x times one half uh, e to the x plus e to the negative x minus e to the x. So, um, so here we are. Um, so, like I was saying, uh, these cancel. So, this first factor is going to become just 2e to the x, which is a very convenient 2. And this thing, if I distribute the minus sign over there, I'm going to have two minus signs in the second term, which are going to cancel out. And here, the e to the x's are going to cancel out. The twos are going to cancel out. Um, and you have e to the x times one half times. Interesting. Um, I copied it wrong. There's a plus. 
<clears throat> times 2 e to the negative x. And these cancel. And now what is e to the x times e to the negative x? e to the minus 2x? Um, I'm going to graph it. What is this function? Wait, that's just one, right? That's just one. Oh, Why is sorry. it one? I don't know. It's like it's rough day. It's not one because you're having a rough day. And also, everyone else must be having a rougher day because they're not saying anything. Uh, why is this one? x minus x equals zero. OK. Uh, so this is, so when you, thank you, Matthew. When you um, multiply uh, two powers with the same base, the exponents add. And then you get e to the 0, which is 1. Honestly, just ignore everything I say today because... But if I do that, I'm going to be so bored because no one <laughs> is just talking. Well, I'm glad I'm providing entertainment at least. Not entertainment, it's feedback. Is that I know if I'm, you know, makes me makes me know if I'm saying things that are just like not, no message is getting across. I don't know if I'm speaking to myself, if no one else says anything. <clears throat> All right, um, so um, this is where we started was cosine hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared. So that's kind of cool that it kind of looks like a trig function. Um, uh, Uh, what else am I supposed to say? Um, so there's other there's other identities um, that I'm not going to prove, but you could. Um, they're they're not hard. For example, the derivative. Um, if you were to take a guess, you would get like half of these right. The derivative of hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic cosine. The derivative of hyperbolic cosine, you would think is it's negative hyperbolic sine, but it's actually just hyperbolic sine. Um, wait, this was just to prove that sine squared plus cosine squared was one. It was, uh, I mean, sort of. Matthew says, what's this just to prove that sine squared plus cosine squared equals one? First of all, that's not what we proved because there's a negative there. Um, but also, you were making it sound like it was a lot more than it was, but I just, I simplified the thing. This was a problem you were probably doing in second grade, not in second grade, but um, probably doing in in your algebra classes. <clears throat> uh, uh, there's a formula for the hyperbolic sine of x plus y, which um, Looks just, and the thing is, these are easier to prove all of them because they're just about exponentials. And I don't remember this formula. It's just the same. Um, it's the same as for the as the trig formula. So, cosine of the other plus sine of the other, cosine of the one. I don't know, there's a lot of them. Um, and there, there's, there is a deep reason why, why this works. Um, why, why this works the same uh, that I'm, you're not gonna get to in many, many classes. Uh, the thing is that hyperbolic sine is the sine of i times x, the square root of negative one divided by i, I think. Divided by i? 
yeah, things so maybe multiply by by maybe negative i, <clears throat> which is um I mean fascinating, but um just not remotely in this class. But there is like a mystery here, which is the thing I care about the most. The mystery of why these act just like um, sine and cosine. Um, the mystery of the the relation between exponential and sine. Okay, uh, that's it. So what do you got to know about hyperbolic sine and cosine? You got to know what they are. Um, and that's it. It's not that important to know the identities between them or anything else. So I'm going to move on to chapter four. Uh, to chapter four is applications of differentiation. Uh, and 4.1 is an extremely important chapter called maximum and minimum values. This is extremely important because um, because the answer to the question um, the answer to the question how do I spend the least amount of money and that is that is a that is a vital question um, not and not necessarily because um, we are uh, we're greedy um, though in some cases obviously it is. Uh, but because some things, some things wouldn't work at all if they weren't efficient. Um, most things in the world, in human civilization, would, wouldn't work nowadays. If we hadn't find, found out a way to make them efficiently. Um, and this is, I think this is by far the, the biggest reason to care about derivatives, how they help us find maximum or minimum values um, of functions. So, um, so what is the maximum value? Uh, let me tell you, <clears throat> I think you know what it is, but take uh, a function f with domain c. Um, we say, um, So we, I have uh, so domain C no domain C was supposed to be a constant a number and C is a number in the domain. So I say f of C is the absolute, or maybe if I don't say anything, I probably mean absolute. So what, what am I supposed to say here? So what is the maximum value? Presumably the word maximum is something you've heard before. Isn't it just like the highest point on a parabola? Like highest curve? Does it have to be a parallel? A curve. Um, yeah, it's the highest point. So highest. Um, highest means everything else is below it. And the height is the, um, the y coordinate. <clears throat> so the, the absolute maximum value is a value where everything else is smaller. Uh, so this is what this is exactly what I'm saying in this formula. Um, everything else, here, so here's everything else, and uh, here is saying that the function is smaller there. And now I wonder what the minimum value is going to be. I would be copying and pasting, but it doesn't let me. because Jambo is pretty bad.
uh, you're the absolute minimum value if everything else is larger. And it is the highest and the lowest point in the graph, but you don't need to draw a graph to have this notion. Um, you could be talking about a function like um, general roller coaster, and there's a function of the force that you experience in the roller coaster, and you can talk about the moment of the most uh, the the most force, the most excitement, and you you can talk about that point at the at the lowest point in the drop uh, without drawing any graphs, for example. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, I think this these are not. Um, These are not complicated notions, basically. Um, but in a, in a graph, um, you see that the functions uh, the a value is smaller if it's under is if it's uh, lower in height, and similarly the. You have a minimum if it's underneath everything. <clears throat> I think if I give you a drawing, you will find the, the absolute maximum and minimum value. Um, let's see an example. So you have really, let's look at this function. So, um, where is the, the absolute maximum and minimum? Negative one and infin negative infinity? Yeah, uh, so uh, this is the, the maximum value. Everything else is below it. And for the minimum, I mean, sure, infinity. But I don't, I, I said that the minimum has to be a number. So the, the minimum doesn't exist. Um, and the thing is, we have to be okay that that is, we have to be to accept um, that that is just something that can happen. So um, this function has no lowest lowest points. Any point you choose um, is going to keep going lower. So you're not going to you you have no chance of finding an absolute lowest point. Um, and I can probably so what's a function that has no maximum or minimum? A straight line. Something odd, uh, yeah. So, for example, x x is a function that has no maximum or minimum. It keeps going. Uh, can you name a largest number? No. Um, if you if you choose a value in there, there's always going to be something bigger. So it's going to be something smaller. It has no maximum or minimum. So the I guess, I guess the first question um, you should be asking is when uh, when do these even exist? Um, before I answer that, let me talk about an equally important concept, which is um, which is th this concept. Um, so you have this um, you have this graph, and the thing is. Um, What is happening here? Um, so what is this? So that is, so the answer is that that is something that looks like the maximum value, but it's not. Uh, it's uh, it's not the absolute value because over here I go above it, but still I want to be able to talk about this because 
um, for example, if the domain was smaller, this would be the, the, the absolute maximum. Basically, if I just ignored everything outside of a, of a little of a little circle. And that leads us to the notion of a relative um, <clears throat> of a relative maximum or minimum. So I say f of c is a relative maximum value if um, um, so the thing is so what what is special about this point? Well, it's not the biggest value, but it is the biggest value um in the blue circle so or maybe even better if in the over this interval of x coordinates so the thing is if i can find if i can just zoom in ignore ignore some parts that are far away from c and and it looks like a maximum i'm going to call that a relative maximum because it's the maximum relative to its neighbors uh say f of c is a relative maximum value if um uh if there is an open interval with a b containing c um with the property with the property that is the maximum there so this value is bigger than every other value, but only if I look at values in the interval. <clears throat> so this is exactly what's happening in the picture. There's, a, there's an interval, and if I just look inside that interval, I this is the biggest one. Uh, there's a person uh, here that is the best sprinter in this well, in this room, in this virtual crappy room that we're in, um, that is, that person is probably not the best printer in the world. I mean, maybe, well, no offense. Um, so that would make you, that would make you not the absolute maximum best printer in the, in the universe, but you would still be a relative maximum to the people who are virtually close to you right now. And and this is the the same idea. Is this the highest point in the roller coaster? Uh, no, but for a while it is. Um, similarly, if only I could copy and paste. Um, f of c is a minimum, a relative minimum value. Um, if, so I'm trying to say the same thing, but I'm also trying to not spend five minutes writing. And if there's an interval with the same property, except with a smaller, a smaller than sign, such that f of c is smaller than or equal to f of x for all x in the interval. So, for example, here um, there's two there's two lowest points, and but probably only one of them is the absolute minimum. So, so this is a relative minimum, and this is um relative and absolute minimum because the one on the left is in the lowest points of this circle that i'm drawing but the one on the right is not only on the on the lowest point of a circle it's in the lowest points of the whole graph that i drew uh so one thing to notice is that um and absolute 
max or a minimum is always uh, relative. If you're using bolts, you're the first passes person in every room you count. Uh, so if you're the absolute maximum, you you're always you 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 can always find a circle in which you're at the relative maximum. Um, but if you're relative maximum, of course you don't have to be the absolute maximum, just like in the examples that I just drew. Okay, so um, so the graph isn't symmetrical, no, because I'm not good at drawing. It could be, in which case there would be both uh, two um, absolute minimums. Now it's definitely not symmetrical. Okay, um, so. Okay, um, let me move on to a very important bit. One of the two very important bits, um, the extreme value theorem. So I've just shown you, clearly functions have no reason to, to have absolute maximum, maxima or minima. I don't know if you prefer me to say the, well, I think I'm, is the correct way to say maxima or say maximums. I could say maximosis. Um, so, but the thing is, functions have no reason to have to reach maximum values or minimum values. Uh, so, when I can guarantee that they do, this is this is very important. Um, and this is what the extreme value theorem tells me. So the theorem says, if a function is continuous on a closed interval. Uh, so closed, I mean, the, the, the endpoints have to be numbers. Um, they cannot be infinity, even though I would call that closed. Uh, closed interval A, B. Then it reaches an absolute maximum and minimum. This is so incredibly important <clears throat> to our lives. So, what I'm saying is, you have a closed interval. And now I have a function that is continuous here, including the endpoints. And however I draw this graph, as long as I draw it continuously, the, the maximum value and the minimum value are always reached. So um, for example, all of, um, I don't know, all of these functions, which are all of these graphs, which are continuous on a closed interval have max a maximum and minimum value. So, um, do you agree based on the pictures? Um, so, for example, in this one, I would make you points, but of course I, I really can't. All of these are the maximum value because you can reach it. You can you can reach it more than once um, because you have to be bigger than or equal to everything else. If you're equal to other points, then that's fine. Uh, you're still the maximum as long as they're not uh, higher than you. 
uh, and this one looks like the minimum value. Uh, here, I'm pretty sure there's the minimum value is around here. And the absolute um, maximum is the endpoint. The endpoint counts. It's in the it's in the closed interval. And if you don't count it, sometimes it doesn't work, um, like you you're just seeing. But where you also have relative maxim maxima and minima, which the this theorem says nothing about. For example, this endpoint is a relative maximum, but I don't care right now. <clears throat> um, this graph similarly has a maximum here and a minimum here. They could be both in the endpoints, like a straight line. What about the last one? What about a horizontal line? A horizontal line is a constant function, a constant function, and constant functions are definitely continuous. Um, where is the maximum and the minimum of a constant function? Is it not Oh, I couldn't see that very well. Say it again. Say I, was, again. I was saying, does it not exist since it's constant all the way to the function? Well, it better exist because I just promised you that it exists and I put it in a in a red rectangle. And I said that it's very important. So I hope I didn't tell you that a lie is very important. Because of a constant function is is continuous. Uh, the interval is closed, so there sh it should exist everywhere. Sam said, every oh, Sam and Matthew both said everywhere. Yeah, all, so in a constant function, all the, uh, all of them are, are maxim, a maxima and minima. So if they asked you, you'd just like kind of write it in interval notation, like if they, or would you just pick a specific point? Well, if I was asked, if, if someone was asking me to tell them all the places which are maxes and mins, I would have to tell them uh, they're everywhere, they're all of them. I don't know why I would, you know, I would much rather say in words, it's all the points, but you know, if this was A and this was B, I would say it's the interval AB, but it seems more natural to me in this example to say just all of them. So I guess this line has to be all blue. Um, I think this is counterintuitive because in day-to-day -day life, when we say someone is the best, we don't mean that there's a tie um, normally. I think if you say someone is the tallest, you don't mean except for people that are equal to them. But um, in math, it's just more convenient to say, to allow a tie and to say things like a, a constant function has a maximum and a minimum everywhere. <clears throat> okay, uh, well, that's, uh, that's it. Tomorrow, I'll tell you how to find the max and minimum points. And it'll be great. And you will be able to get rich using math, which is what we all came here for. I mean, obviously not me, I'm a teacher. Um, I'm gonna stop recording and I'm gonna